Shooting it raw? Yes. Shooting it raw. Hello. It's Sharon Kwok. Hi there. <laughs> How many pigeons live in your house just so that I can get good levels? <laughs> I guess it's not a line you hear from too many people. <laughs> Somebody who keeps raising pigeons, and I I only recently discovered that there is such a thing, really, um, decided to give me a few pairs of pigeons. I have three pairs of them. Oh, wow. And, uh, well, I have a garden. So they each pair has its own cage, and the doors are open during daytime. But nighttime, I try to keep it closed in case there's any sort of something that might hurt them we do have snakes here Mm -hmm. yeah about uh, two weeks ago we had a common rat snake come over and it was about five feet long i'm having an aviary built but that's the problem um i'm still trying to find the right kind of mesh that would be snake proof huh so yeah (laughs) what what, the place where we bought our our bed from uh we bought like this we bought off this family uh really amazing bed it's like this old uh chinese style interlocking massive pieces of wood it's like it's such a monster of a bed uh they were raising peahens and peahens Mm. look like i don't know if you know what they look like but they look like yeah yeah yeah, it's a cartoon birds and they they kept they kept them to keep snakes away which i thought was amazing peahens do that i didn't know Mm -hmm. that yeah (laughs) i think this is a good good time to introduce who you are so first of all thank you so much for joining me on the podcast on shooting it raw uh you are sharon kwok i have known you for uh for a few years now not really sitting with you very much just kind of i don't know comets kind of passing each other (laughs) in the heavens every once in a while that's rather apt description (laughs) Thank you so much for joining me. We're going to get into the the photos and and what you've been up to and just share a bit of who you are. And but before we do that, I think it'd be kind of cool to talk about okay, describe where you are right now and what is around you right now like physically. I'm sitting in my living room actually. Um and to my left, sliding doors, the garden, the pigeon coops <laughs> they're now probably uh, pro- properly inside and and safe uh we did have a snake scare a couple of weeks ago which killed one of my birds that i hand raised uh it, it was something else it was a, a a thrush actually but we just passed this season in hong kong where uh there's a lot of young baby birds available for sale in bird street so normally around this time I'd be traveling, <laughs> mm-hmm. but this year nobody's traveling. So um, not really anyway. So I uh, I ended up, well, doing more work around the house. And uh, I do visit Bird Street to buy food for my other pets. And uh, there's this one stall there that I keep buying stuff from her. And um, I'm not happy with it because she has... Actually, she doesn't look after her animals very well. Mm. And so every time I see this or that and they just, you know, they look sickly or frankly, they do not make a good pet. What on earth are you doing with this sort of thing? I end up through the years I have purchased a great number of birds from this stall and um, many of them have found homes elsewhere because I I never really wanted these birds in the first place. I just wanted to save them. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So some of them, like uh, there have been a nest of kingfishers, white throateds, that ended up, uh, yeah, (laughs) right. That's crazy. They they ended up with Ocean Park. Yeah, okay, good, good. Yeah, and and then some of them, if you're really careful, if you think that the species does better, uh, as a wild species, you have to really be careful not to handle them because otherwise they get too used to humans and mm-hmm. they just don't do well in the wild. Sure, sure. So um, most of them, I, they find good homes elsewhere if I can't keep them because I, you know, in Hong Kong, you you don't want to over overcrowding is always an issue. <laughs> mm-hmm. For the people who don't know who you are, I mean. Look, I don't know your your life story very well, but I know that you're a child were a child actress. Is that right? Uh, actually, no. My 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 mom started me sort of doing modeling stuff when I was quite little, and um, I guess I had 
one of those Brookshield mom type moms. <laughs> so um, I had a, a bit of that as a child, but uh, I then spent a number of my formative years in California. So uh-huh. I was born in Hong Kong. Okay. And my father was one of the founding members at Ocean Park. Oh, wow. Okay. So I grew up there uh, and I, without thinking much about it, but I definitely assisted with a lot of the animal husbandry there as a child even. So, you know, from birthing to prepping their foods to prepping their medicines and, and assisting with injections of dolphins and whatnot. So I, you know, I was only a few years old then, but I, I was really into it, much more so than my brother. So anyways, I, I, I then went to the States and... Um, after a number of years there, I ended up coming back to Hong Kong um, because of actually beauty pageants. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not something that I, I may have chosen for myself um, as a first choice, but it, it was something that something fun to do. Sure, made my mom happy, and uh, um, I might have probably been happier as a veterinarian. <laughs> <laughs> So, but after coming back to Hong Kong, would have been my late teens, then I started acting here. Oh, okay, okay. So, I, I you know, I arrived in, in Hong Kong in 2003, and, mm. you know, by the time I got here, I, in, in my, you know, I don't even know, early 30s, <clears throat> and so I, I certainly didn't know you culturally, and I have no anchors to sort of say, oh, to recognize you, and, and maybe I did have seen you in, in various films, but but what I what really caught my attention was that one time I, we're having this uh, general meeting, you know, with with Ocean Park and WWF and Shark Rescue and and all these different uh, marine groups, and then you show up, and clearly everybody turns around to look, and you show up in this beautiful like evening gown, you know, perfect makeup. Huh? Like, you just like yeah, you just came in. And I you're like look, guys, don't I can't, remember this. I can't <laughs> stay. I can't stay because I have to MC a show. But so we had this pretty heavy meeting about okay, how do we position ourselves to raise awareness for shark, shark conservation? Oh, I remember now. Okay. okay, I did. I did have to do something. I had to work. I had to do. Uh, I was master of ceremonies at at this event, but. I also needed to attend this, so it was mm-hmm. quite embarrassing. I no, do not no. mean to make splashes like that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was great. I thought it was great. I was just like, you know, you come in the room and say, look, everybody, I'm really sorry. No, I'm I mean, so done. Normally, I am. I am. I, I enjoy being grunged. Okay, I, I, you know, I'm a diver. Come on, we don't. Yeah. <laughs> No, I loved it. I, I loved it. Like it's, and it's really funny because some of the faces in the room were just like, "Who the hell's that?" And some faces were just like, "Oh yeah, yeah, that's Sharon." I mean, look, Sharon does that kind of thing. You know, <laughs> I was just like, "Wow, man." Well, I, I had a gig, I guess. <laughs> no, you definitely did. It was awesome. It was great. I yeah. was really uh, so. So, anyways, uh, from that work and that kind of just exposure i just you know we've kind of crossed paths and uh and this dovetails nicely into the first photo because you know we've been kind of friendly for for a long time and uh and i thought it'd be really great to have you on on the podcast so you sent me three photos and let's just dive right in and uh, the first one i think is just so is so perfect it's just you on this uh i guess it's covered in felt black felt uh or velvet and you're in in a nice little black little dress and and uh, you know nice watch and nice accessories looking very fine and sitting on your belly is this beautiful 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 cat and uh, the the image is called Sharon and Zuka so what's the story of this what is who is Zuka uh, well Zuka is my cat <laughs> that is your but, cat yes but he's he actually passed away a couple of years ago um he had diabetes Mm-hmm. And savannas are prone to that. Now, I it's no secret I live with numerous animals. I've got this tegu. I've got a number of birds here. I've got uh, four, the two rescued dogs and two rescued cats. And actually, most of the birds are rescued. Um, mm. So I, it's just I have always lived with animals. I can't really feel at home if the home doesn't have animals. So that's just, you know. <laughs> I'm the package deal. <laughs> what a great photo. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, but that, a- that cat, yes, he 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 was gorgeous. So I, I must say when I was younger, much younger, I'm 50 now, okay, by the mm-hmm, way. So mm-hmm. when I was in my 20s, early 20s, I, I was still involved with dog shows and nothing really against dog shows, especially if people want to breed dogs to maintain or improve the standard of the breeds. Mm-hmm. That's wonderful. Got it. But 
there's a lot of, as with all beauty pageants, <laughs> and I do say that um, with full intent, there's always a lot of bickering and politics and, and silliness, actually, if you ask me, on, on the side. So all that went on with dog shows, and I kind of got fed up with it. Mm. Um, but I, I used to breed animals for show. In fact, I, I also I'm a Pekingese judge oh. um, with AKC, and I bred Pekingese. Um, I had Amstaffs, American okay. Staffordshire Terriers. I had a uh, miniature poodle. Ah. But I don't do that, and I haven't done that for a long time. Um, so I've got a mutt at home now. His name is Ugly. Mm, nice. <laughs> And I've got another uh, Ashiba that um, was going to be put to sleep. Ah. Someone just didn't want him anymore, and he kind of used up his time at the SPCA, and they were running out of room. So, right. so he's here. But that having been said, I, I, you know, do I still appreciate stunning, beautiful animals? Yes. And when uh, on one of my visits to the states, I um, met a friend of mine who. Um, well, a couple, elder couple, who their two older daughters already, um, they they each had a savanna. Mm -hmm. So I met these cats, and I thought, wow, they don't really act like cats. They 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 go to the beach with them. They fetch a frisbee. Wow. They, <laughs> wow. They they they're fast, and they run. They're powerful, big animals, and um, and I thought this is really cool. Um, at the time, my one main pet that you know glued to me all the time my my dog then had just passed away and she was 18 oh, so wow. i thought okay maybe i'll get another serious you know pet and and see how that goes mm -hmm. and so began the uh, the 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 long winded journey of trying to get zuka to hong kong it took over a year oh, okay because no one's ever brought a savannah in before and they didn't really want it to happen but um you know looking at all the rules and regulations i i complied with everything but in order to bring him in, he had to have all his shots. Sure, sure. And in order to have all the shots, the cat had to be a certain age before he could receive all the shots. Yeah. And so my cat didn't arrive until it was about 10, 11 months old, which is not very good with an animal like that because the, the, the main formative years would be when they're quite very young. You really want to be like like with a young parrot. Some of the species that um, people know become a bit more aggressive, like the the smaller macaws, mm -hmm. uh, yellow collars and severes. You you need to socialize them a lot when they're very young. Sure. You try to have strangers cuddle them, pet them, play with them, so that they know. But um, I didn't get that with this cat because by the time it got to me, it was that big and. It was a very serious handful. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, yeah, I, I, I picking him up at the airport. My my brother was there, and you'll like this story. Actually, we had a bet. Mark is my brother's name, so Mark says um, he would bet me anything that I wouldn't be able to tame this cat because it was hissing and it, it just looked it right. looked pretty impossible. Yeah. And so I said, "Well, what do you want to bet?" So we we ended up. Um, the bet was I would treat his whole family to whatever vacation he wanted <laughs> if I lost. <laughs> a good and, proper, and, a good proper sibling <laughs> bet, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, but hey, but if he lost, if he lost, now yeah. there really wasn't anything I really wanted off of him at the time. You see, so, so, so I don't know. If we could get crude on this, but <laughs> well, no, listen, hey, listen, as crude as you like, man. Just let all right. It rip. Well, see, so, 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 basically, I own his balls now. Oh, that's nice. Still, <laughs> still, I still don't know what I want to do with him. Ah, I might just ask him to have him tattooed someday. That's but <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but, but he, um, yeah, I, it, I had about eight months to tame this thing, and um, the the trial, the the test, actually to see whether I actually tamed him or not was I had to walk this cat on a leash down whatever street he chose in Hong Kong. Oh, wow. wow and he that's... picked Fish Street in Mong Kok. Oh, what? You, yeah. I, I, I respect your family. You guys have, have some serious... <laughs> There's a bit of sadism there for sure. Yeah, well, anyways, but but Zuka's gone now. It was um it was a lot of work and um I I enjoyed having him around a lot, 
Um, we were very closely bonded, but uh-huh. yeah, it was quite emotional when he left. I, I wanted him to be around a bit longer. He was with me for about 13, 14 years. Right. But, you know, that's... You yeah. know, I have in my house, I don't know if you know this, I have five dogs and five cats. And they're all rescues here and there. So, cool. you know, so we're kind of like the crazies that you you sound like a little bit of, you know, the animals <laughs> and everything. But, but well, so, for so, us, it's normal. But yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. <laughs> but one of the things that, 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 okay, so the image is, okay, so the in the background, there's this black velvet, like curtains, and your, the sort of the seat is draped, there's like black, very rich, sumptuous sort of fabric on it. Uh, there's diffused light. Like it looks like a light box. It doesn't look like an amateur photo. It looks like a proper. It's a studio shot. Yeah, it looks like a studio shot. It yeah, looks it is perfectly. A studio, yeah. yeah, you know your hair is perfect. Uh, you're you're sort of draped on this on this on this seat, and the, the cat looks big. You know, it's not. It's it. You, it's obviously larger well, than I, a. Dumb... I'm the kitty sofa. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> but but I mean, it's such a. He's got a. Beautiful. I mean, it's like a beautiful animal, and I'm just like, wow, that's a really strong. I mean, if you're into into pets, into cats, into animals, the expression on both of you is really um, exquisite. It's really just a beautiful image. It's really nice. I, Thank I, you. Thank yeah, you. No, I love it. I love it. Yeah, he was he was a stunning animal. I would take him to SBCA's Dogathon every year, mm-hmm. and um, all the dogs would give him a wide berth. Yeah, he looks like a badass. One. Okay. Except one. There was one dog ever that dared try to attack him. And that was Gigi Fu's Pekingese. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now if you if you know Pekingese, yeah, that would be a Pekingese thing to do. Right, okay. Right. <laughs> yeah, did did but, uh, did did the dog uh, regret it? No, because um, <laughs> actually one of the clauses for bringing my cat into Hong Kong was the front claws had to be removed oh man you so know he his front claws were declawed but if he what he wasn't uh-huh. um the Pekingese would have lost an oh, eye for at sure least. for sure yeah. for sure uh you know for the people who you know we we had a cat uh and we, we named him kuson right now if you speak hebrew mm. in hebrew uh this is going to sound a little rough okay but anyway so so in hebrew like the it's kind of a the, the way you say the word cunt is kus right or kusit and it's okay. kind of and it's it's kind of rude, of course, and uh, it's, it's actually as rude in Hebrew as it is in, in, in English, and okay. and in Hebrew nouns get turned into masculine and fem- feminine, so you can say like you know kind as masculine, which is a kuson, and actually in the vernacular, you know, in the slang. Oh, I need to learn more about this. <laughs> yeah, in the, in the slang, that's actually the way, the, how you describe it. These would be a, really good names to call some people. Of course, of course. <laughs> but actually, it's used as a real compliment. Like, oh, wow, as a kuson, like, what a what a good looking, like, what a beautiful cunt, you I know, see. as a guy. Okay, okay, okay. And so this cat, kuson, was the most beautiful cat. And we didn't realize that when you go get your cat declawed, they essentially amputate the cat's digits yeah. and i was just well, like oh my god they they amputate just the 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 first yeah. um just up to the first knuckle because yeah. otherwise they they hurt the claw and it'll still grow back exactly but it's just like we had no idea until we went and picked him up and then he's just like holding up his paws like look what you did to me and we're just like yeah. oh my god i'm so yeah. sorry yeah okay well let's move on to the next photo because uh it's it's equally um dramatic and stunning it's you with an Asian elephant uh, standing maybe in Thailand, maybe in Sri Lanka. What's yeah, that Thailand. photo? What's that photo? That was just, um, that was, uh, it was an iPhone shot. Um, I was bathing the elephant. <laughs> nice. <laughs> we were in a river. Do you, are, do you have a connection to to the elephants in Thailand? Because I know you, you are doing conservation for... Yes. Well, I have connections to people who do conservation work of many different types of species throughout the world. Mm-hmm. Okay, so so is this particular, for example, in the photograph of you with this beautiful, um, looks like a male, Asian elephant, I mean, is this connected to a particular campaign or is this just a, sort of one of the places? Uh, no, 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 no. It was just one of the, the sanctuaries that I visited that I, I do try to help support some of these groups. Mm-hmm. So from Africa to Malaysia to Thailand, um, I, I do have a number of friends that, that 
sometimes I try to help raise funds or I just I just send money when needed. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to build a halo for myself here. It's just that, you know, it's not something I, I talk about publicly much because what's a big deal, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if I was in trouble, you know, people like us, we would help each other anyway. So it's, it's really not a big deal. But for example, recently um, in Malaysia, you've got the fires, you've got the storms. I, my friend's house, his lower level, his first story, the ground floor, um, he's up to his chest in water again. And I'm like, why do you guys live next to the river? It happens every year. Right, right. You know, one year when I went to visit him in Sumatra, I jokingly brought him a bunch of, um, well, waterproof, like deep sea lights. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, the stuff we use when we go diving, flashlights, yeah. but but divers' flashlights. And, and I said, here you go. Just keep this charge. You know, you'll, you'll always have a light if you get flooded again. And sure enough, he really does use it. Ugh. One other thing that they do there, though, is that that village actually helps look after that whole sanctuary. It's this large area. So in other words, they sort of guard that place. And it's not just um, they they have a lot of animals there. They have uh, from pangolins to some some of the smaller gray cats, uh, orangutans, um, a lot of slow lorises, certain bird species such as minas, but you know, Nia's hill minas, there's only like three left over there that they could find. Oh, wow. And it's a very large black mina. It's actually the largest mina, which when I was a child, you could still find them at Bird Street in Hong Kong. Wow. So things that you could find at Bird Street, you you frankly, you know, you've got that gut instinct. I, <laughs> you know it doesn't belong in Hong Kong. Sure. And you kind of know, okay, how the hell did it get there, right? But... If you try to just put out of business one or two little shops, it's not going to do any good. Mm-hmm. If someone wanted to stop that whole industry, that that illegal trail of, of um, wild-caught pets, and that's I, I do say that because I think that it is what it is, and it's not just birds. Sometimes you're looking at reptiles and whatever else. Mm-hmm. And they these, these groups... You know, they do deal with illegal pets, they deal with illegal wildlife trafficking, some of it's for food, some of them are endangered species, app one, they deal with pangolins, whatever else. And then, of course, they're probably linked with ivory, and they're probably also linked with arms and human trafficking. Sure. It gets, it gets serious. Yeah, really, it gets really dangerous and really dirty yeah. and really, yeah, it's full on. Yeah, so, so, you know, dealing with just one little shop, one little stall in Hong Kong really isn't going to change a big, big picture. Mm-hmm. What needs to be done is governments governments need to work together. Policing needs to be a lot stricter. And um, from from legislature to, to policing to penalties, everything needs to be stronger. I'm with you 100%. In fact, I think this kind of uh, links well to the next photo that you sent over. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's great. You've got the, the Hong Kong skyline in the background, which is always dramatic. And you've got about, I don't know, 50, 60 people uh, on, I guess, the elephant walk. What was, what was that day? Oh, that was, that's what, that was what was left with a group. Okay, okay. <laughs> a lot more people earlier. Okay, so what's the story there? Right, okay, we started Elephant Walk in 2013. And um, I actually, I've been working on the shark fin, or rather anti-shark fin situation for... Gosh, I really don't remember, but I'm sure over a dozen years. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's been a long time. I haven't really counted. So shark fin, to me, has some similarities with ivory because Hong Kong has been known as the hub for both of these trades. Right. Okay, ivory, we've got you know some of the most skilled craftsmen in, in the world, and, and they make amazingly beautiful work. But unfortunately... Um, it's from poached elephants. Right. And then, of course, you've got the shark fin issue. And that's, come on, I mean, Hong Kong's been um, supplying dried seafood to the rest of China for centuries. Yeah. I wouldn't even say decades. So it's something that's been ongoing. However, in the past, it's all been based on manpower. We were only able to take what we could with manpower. Then, of course, with starting, say, late 80s, early 90s, we've got all the tech, we've got GPS, we got bottom trawling purse <laughs> That was the demise of many species. Mm-hmm. 
So now the first elephant walk that started in 2013 was because of Ivory. And um, we felt we really needed to do something before the psychonic species completely disappeared. So it was then it was more of a protest, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and in those days, which wasn't that long ago, I was more open to the idea of doing protests. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for obvious reasons. <laughs> but today, yeah, yeah, you kind of just don't want to go there anymore oh, today. You, you have to do things differently. But so then the first elephant walk, we did have only about maybe, I don't know, 80 people or so. That was not the one you saw the picture of. Mm -hmm. um, and we spent the whole day, we stationed ourselves in front of Chinese Arts and Craft. Right. In um, at, uh, let's see, where was this? This was near 1881 in Chim Sa Choi. Mm -hmm. And uh, within half a year, the three largest retailers of elephant ivory in Hong Kong had stopped selling elephant ivory. And we, we have been hounding them. Mm -hmm. We were writing to them. We were writing to their, uh, uh, well, the people that, that, that uh, were also on their board, Whatever we could do, we tried, and, and it worked with those three large uh, mm -hmm. companies. However, the trade still goes on, and we will see a complete ban, a complete end to the trade of elephant ivory in Hong Kong by next year. Yeah, well, that's great. I'm wondering if it's good enough. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, of course. It was like with shark fin. It, in, for me, I was really hitting the gas, hitting the gas. And I felt like, wow, there's progress. It seems to be getting better. But then people kind of just step back and then it pops up in other directions. And, and it really takes a lot of, uh, it, yeah, it takes a lot of commitment and it takes a lot of energy. But it's, it's hard not to burn out. And, and so how do you... You know, there's, there's actually more of a link to both of these um, traits uh, to to me than than most people know, and I don't elaborate on it too much. But it's also something that I I don't need to hide. With Ivory, um, as a teenager, when I first came back to Hong Kong, and I was making movies, and I was doing TV work, radio, whatever. On some of my spare time, I'd help my mother source things. Now she had a jewelry store in San Francisco. And she would sell anything from pearls to diamonds, gold stuff, uh, semi-precious stones. I, you know, I know my stones and stuff like that because of that. Mm -hmm. I also actually used to teach arts in San Francisco. I had my own art exhibit when I was 16. I used to teach at the Asian Art Institute in San Francisco. So I'm a fine arts person. Okay. When I first came back to Hong Kong, though, and I was sourcing for mom, I also sourced ivory for her. Sure. And I was told, of course, that these animals died of old age, of natural causes, and how better to show your respect for these animals than to preserve their memory and beautiful artwork. Mm -hmm. And I believed it. I completely believed it to a point where I was helping train some of the carvers um, that we had. My mom would buy from wholesalers. So I was helping the wholesale companies, and there are only five families in Hong Kong that do it. So I was helping them train some of their carvers without, well, without pay or anything, because I just want to see them do a better job. Mm -hmm. So I would scalp things. Like, for instance, if I didn't like the way that they were doing a dragon's claws, I would just scalp some claws on, on a chunk of clay and harden it, make sure it's, it's, it's solid, then you know, give it hand it over to them, and, and they could just copy that or right. learn from that. So I, I did a number of these things, but then eventually I learned the truth. Mm -hmm. And I was furious. I really was. I was depressed. And I was furious. With shark fin, not quite as much in the sense that I, I didn't trade in shark fin. But my mother had friends in San Francisco. And, and I, I, in turn, was affiliated with them, actually through martial arts. But it's all within the family. And they actually ran a shark fin business sure. from California to Hong Kong. And they were... They were shipping stuff from Mexico to California to Hong Kong and so on and so forth. And before they knew what I was doing, I would be able – I had full access mm -hmm. to all their freezers. And I remember one time I brought a couple of friends. Um, well, who was it? it? Was It was Michael Aw, David Dubelay. Uh, there were a couple of photographers. I, I just – 
decided that day, oh, let's go and check out the shark fin freezer. I brought them in and, oh, my God, is that a great white fin? So we were taking wow. pictures and doing our research. But unfortunately, they had a, a camera on and this old guy that opened the doors for us to go in and, and do our research. I wouldn't have named the, the shop anyways, but he got into trouble because his boss is in San Francisco. Right. saw through the camera that he let, let a bunch of cameramen right. in. I said, what the hell's going on? So the old guy lost his job. And, and my mother got a bit harassed after that. <sighs> I understand that you have, on the micro level, you've got people who are just trying to make a living or just you know trying to make a good living or whatever it is. And everybody's going about it in their own way. And, and people get informed and hopefully learn and, and improve things. And, and things hopefully are getting better over time. So ideally, people are learning about the impact and, and can change that behavior. Well, but then some people just don't give a shit. Like some people are just like, well, I'm just going to keep doing it until... Yeah. Now, those are the guys with the money who just want to have everything. And they, they, they feel completely, well, apart from everyone else like oh i have money therefore i can do whatever i want you get those especially if they're really older mm. and it's very hard to change their minds but with regards to people that are well as you mentioned you know the micro um folks that are out making a living and making ends meet when the demand stops they will have to stop and seek alternative sure. means of making a living anyway now Shark fin, if unchecked, is all. It, it really was a sunset industry, anyways. Yeah. Because there's absolutely no way, in spite of the the, the myriad of species and, and numbers of sh sharks available, there's just no way that demand could meet supplies because they stockpile. Mm -hmm. And shark fin lasts forever. Once you harvest it. And I don't like using that word, but there's no option. Once you take it in, though, and, and, and you dry it, you preserve it, it can last indefinitely. Sure. So they stockpile and they, they can sell slowly and steadily. Now, you think, you know, of course, you've got people that say, um, you know, my whole family has, has based their, their living uh, for, for generations on, on dried seafood. Now you're telling us to stop. Why should us? Why, why, why should we? Mm -hmm. Why should I? What's in it for me? Now, to be honest, most of these companies that have been dealing with the dried seafood trade are very well off already. They, <laughs> they are extremely well off. Even Hong Kong's local fishermen. Mm-hmm. They, they are actually quite extremely well off. But they, they have that cultural card and they have been living here for generations and they have been doing that for generations. So the government needs to work with them to seek amicable and uh, viable solutions so that everyone wins in the end. And, mm -hmm. and that, yes, I, I do agree with that. But sometimes we, we need to sit back and... and, and Understand that it's a race against time, and these species won't won't be around that much longer while we make our decisions if we don't act quickly enough. Right. Well, ex well, exactly. So, so what? Okay. So you're the kind of person who, as you say, you know, if you call me during the day, I'm going to have like 50 notifications and, and distractions <laughs> and things chasing after me and so it's like call me at 11 at, at night and maybe we can have a call we can have a talk with i'll wait you know i'll sit in the in the car where it's quiet and we can have our, our call well hey 11's when my night begins when my peace begins <laughs> you're you're amazing you're amazing so so as somebody who are clearly from very young are sort of like a gifted overachiever and, and i'll say in a bad way just like you you you're ambitious you have you're, you have a strong work ethic and you, you commit yourself and your energy to a lot of different things. Is there now, because you, with COVID, everybody having to essentially be a lot more closed in, what, like, how are you channeling your energy? Well, first of all, I, 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 I thank you for thinking so well of me. I, I don't feel that I'm doing enough because there's just too much that needs to be done. There's, there's just far too much for any one person to be able to tackle, to be honest. It doesn't matter who you are. 
Right. You talk to Jane, and Jane Goodall. You talk to Sylvia, and these are these are women that I admire greatly. And and Sylvia actually had a hand in my actually walking this path because years ago, Sylvia Plath, Sylvia Earle. Yeah, she she invited me to join her board, and I said, I looked at her, my jaw kind of dropped, and I said, Wait, you're kidding me, right? Because you guys, I mean, you you design submersibles on your spare mm. time for fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You guys are scientists. You know, I'm just some beauty queen, some actress from Hong Kong. What do you think I can do, right? Mm -hmm. And she's like, well, no. And, you know, with her famous deep voice, she's like, well, in this day and age, and it still holds true, okay, in this day and age, what's really important for conservation is to be able to reach and educate the masses. You don't have to be the one doing the research yourself. Mm-hmm. You don't have to do the science part yourself, although I find it fascinating and it's really fun. And I was in a submarine not too long ago, and it's just, wow, everyone's got to try it. But, okay, I don't want to digress. <laughs> but really, you don't need to be the one doing the homework. You quote other people's homework. You make sure people know it's not your homework, and it's really not important. But you take that information. You make sure – People understand. You help educate the public. Mm-hmm. You know, I look at I look at China now, and I look at China twenty years ago, right. thirty years ago, when I started filming there. The change is just ah oh, makes your head spin. Sure, and if anything, that's a times when you feel like you're going to lose a little bit of hope. We can at least observe that you know people can change, and there is. You know, there is some reason to, to be optimistic. Now, with with any society, you have to look at, first of all, you've got your population size and the diversity mm-hmm. and the size of the place. I mean, this is China we're talking about. Mm. We're not talking about Hong Kong. Hong Kong, you need to really zoom in on your Google map, all right? China, it's, it's, it's in your face. Yeah. It's right there. And you can't miss it. So we're looking at, there's more diversity in China than the U.S. of A. Because China is also very controlled and we don't see... Yeah, but if you look at all the small tribes, I'm, I'm talking about all the different small tribes. I, in stateside, yes, we have diversity, but, but most of the people in the states have, have very easy access to education. Whether they make the most advantage of it is a different story. But in China, we are looking at a lot of small tribes in rural areas that you know there's there's people farming uh for a living they they and they don't get that education mm-hmm. so how do you reach these people who were brought up thinking that and there's a famous si- of chinese saying where anything with its back facing the sky is there for man to eat mm-hmm. so how do you reach these people for china you must work with the government and and it's it's so promising now because you look at the head of um, IUCN right now is a Chinese guy. Mm-hmm. It's one of the top uh, agendas in China now to do whatever they can with regards to conservation. Now I know that clean air, clean energy, um, clean water these are way up on the list, but wildlife as well. Three years ago I went to Shanghai. Three years ago I went to Beijing. A few months ago, before this whole COVID thing, I again went to these places, and especially Shanghai, I was shocked. Mm -hmm. I tell you, I was shocked. You know, by the bun there, by the river, the river still looked murky. You can't help it because it's a silty river. It, It flows through the whole of China. You can't help that. But both sides of the river, as far as the eye can see, wherever I went, it was clean there were trees there was blue sky white clouds there were birds i was able to ident- identify species the air was clean completely breathable three years ago <laughs> no three years no ago, i know i know i know i'm just laughing I'm just like, <laughs> how the hell did it happen <laughs> well there, of course there is there, there there's a large machinery that that china can can you know command uh yes. to sort of to take action If I can, I also want to, I really do want to rope in. I want to give you some time to talk about Aqua Meridian because yes. that's an incredibly inspiring uh, initiative. So, so what, what is the birth of Aqua Meridian? Well, now I, I've been on the board of a couple of, of NGOs. I, 
had been on the board of WWF for six years, Wild A, still actually. Sylvia Earle's Mission Blue, I'm still on, and I've been on that board for a number of years, since it started, actually. And um, sometimes you need to have your own NGO to be able to just act immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially if you want to act immediately, if you're, you have questions about whether something is 100% positive, would there be any backlash? Would there be any problems, any issues arising from it? And if there is any heat, I don't want to drag anyone else into the flames. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you, you want to do it on your own. Um, but the other thing would, of course, be Aqua Meridian essentially is, is a Hong Kong-based NGO. I'm trying to bridge the gap um, between places so that we could work together. Now, I, my father is actually American of Germanic descent. He's blonde, blue-eyed, so I'm half white. Mm-hmm. <laughs> my mother is Chinese, and she's from Beijing. Um, and uh, her family is Guomindong, actually, so I've got some family in, in Taiwan still. But, you know, it's really, to me, I, I try so hard to not deal with any politics. It doesn't have anything to do with conservation because – it doesn't feel that important compared to the big picture. Sure. You know, I, I feel that we're living on the Titanic right now. All right. And, and the ship is sinking. We've been hit by the iceberg called humanity and plastics <laughs> and pollution and whatever else you want to call it. And, and we're sinking. So wow, your, your movie is a little bit dark. <laughs> well, if you're, if you're, you know, if, if you th- work hard, you'll be able to patch up the holes mm-hmm. and survive it. We haven't sunk yet. But if you're still concerned about where to hang the paintings and where to put the furniture while the ship is sinking, yeah. then, hey, man. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm, I hear you. Um, so Aquameridian, how old is the, is the organization now? Uh, it's eight years old now. Eight, okay. Yeah. Come in, it's been around. Um, yeah, so this year, last year also, uh, we weren't able to do the elephant walk. We are trying very hard to think of a means of perhaps doing it um online if possible this year i don't know if we'll have as much of a, a response if we do it that way because it had become a fun outing for a lot of people they'd bring sure. their pets you know they, they they can bring their dogs on the walk um we eventually made it an annual thing where we walk from the piers to the peak mm-hmm. oh wow okay yeah Bit pier to peak. It's, nice. it's quite easy and the youngest person who walked it on her own was seven Okay. So, yeah, she cool. wasn't carried or pushed any other way. She made right. a point of it. So for the people who don't know, never been to Hong Kong, from the pier, which is, you know, uh, sea level, to the peak, which is probably about, I don't know, 600 meters or something. It's I mean, it's a, it's a fair distance. It takes a couple of hours. Yeah, for a seven-year-old. it's seven a comfortable yeah. walk. You don't have to run it. Sure. You don't have to rush it. Of course, we've got a few that are, I got to be first. You know, yeah. we had a few of those. And, and. They they finished it before I even got to the peak. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> where did they go? <laughs> so, but but it's a, meant to be a fun thing for everyone. And um, other than the first time when it was a protest, every year we highlight a species. Uh, you, we usually have that species mascot, mm-hmm. um, and we try to educate people about it. So the year that we had the pangolin, for example, I couldn't buy the mascot. I spent over a month making that damn thing yeah, myself. Yeah. No, I know, I know. It's, uh, uh, it's and I ended up actually making three of them because <laughs> one one ended up in Singapore and one ended up in Africa. They couldn't mm. buy a pangolin mascot. So for for somebody who wants to learn about, so for example, you know, in terms of the conservation side, uh, Aqua Meridian is is Hong Kong scope. No, it's meant to be international, but based okay. in Hong Kong. Yes. Right, got it. With your with your perspective, right, with with this many years passionately and dedicatedly committing to to wildlife conservation, how would you how would you reach or inspire uh, a fifteen year old, you know, the 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 twelve year old you or the fifteen year old you who's kind of like, well, what can I do? How can I make a difference? Oh, if it were reaching kids like me, that'd be easy. <laughs> oh, okay, but it's the ones that. See, I'm I'm not concerned about children who have access to the kind of upbringing that I did. Okay. 
Okay, they would find their way. And in fact, there are a bunch of children that I work with sometimes. There's a 13-year-old who's now, oh, she's 16 now. Gosh, time flies. But she was in LegCo with me. She was voicing out to try to get Hong Kong's government to increase the um, area uh, for protection for the uh, green sea turtles in okay. uh, Shamwan. Oh, wow. So, And she wrote this speech all by herself. And I had to, I read it. I said, wait a minute, Caitlin, you got to take this down several notches. You can sound like you cannot sound like you're 30. <laughs> I can't I can't have people thinking I wrote it for you. Right. <laughs> so but there are these wonderful kids. But I'm more concerned about the children who've been brought up in a very different way. For example, one time I remember I was walking down a pier. And I had my, I had a Pekingese dog with me then. It was many years ago. And she was only five pounds. So she's a small Pekingese. And she was very well trained. I didn't have to have her on her leash. She's used to walking to my left side because she's a show dog. Uh -huh. so I was walking along the pier and this mother with her child was walking towards me. And as they neared me, the mother started speaking a very high, in a very high-pitched Whaley type of voice. Oh, stay away from that thing. It's a dog. It's going to bite you. Right. Come, come, come. Stay away from it. If it bites you, you're going to get rabies. I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. All right. Now, these are the people that worry me. No, for sure. You know, look, and I have five dogs. I walk them around and... You know, we've we've heard and seen it all of people just like, oh, it's going to bite you. Be careful. Oh, yeah, of course. Of course. Um, but yeah, you're right. Those are the people you need to reach. Absolutely. How to reach those people's kids. <laughs> sure, sure. You might never be able to reach them. All right. Now, you know, doing what I do, I, I also work with SBCA and, and um, you know, I have to be aware of a lot of the humane issues that are around. Um so I, I make myself watch sometimes the most horrific things, even though it gives me nightmares. I need sure. to know what's going on. So you see footage, for example, PETA stuff, or, or you see stuff filmed in, say, a market in China where they're eating dogs and cats. Yeah. And the kind of hell that they put these animals through during slaughter is just – it makes my mind – just it baffles me. I, I don't understand why they have to do it that way. Yeah, there's there's killing and then there's killing. <laughs> yeah, no, you really I don't have to be cruel about it. No, I gotcha. Yeah, but okay. So these people are used to slaughtering their animals in all sorts of um, very creative or nauseating ways. These are the adults doing the work. Yeah. But they're children, and there's sometimes there's toddlers. Yeah. They walk around while this is going on. They're just hanging around the shops and the stalls where the parents are working, stuffing kittens into steamers. Yeah, no, it's full or, on. It's so, so that's what really scares me. Not the adults. It's how these children will grow up when they're completely desensitized. Sure. They wouldn't have any empathy because they haven't been brought up to have any. Hmm. So that worries me. And um, I think that, you know... Uh, after all, I did say a number of good things about where China's going. And China's aware that these are situations that, that they need to look into. We just don't know how long before it'll get there. Frankly, to me, I, I'm not a vegetarian completely yet. I still eat my eggs. I, I have my poultry because mm -hmm. I have some animals that eat meat. So I will keep eating some meat. But I haven't had, um, say, anything on four legs. For sure over two dozen years but to me if you're going to kill an animal it really doesn't matter what kind of animal you're killing if you want to talk um ethics right it's it's how you do it yeah. so you know when i hear people saying oh the chinese eat dogs well there are people in europe eating dogs there are sure. people in korea eating, eating dogs so i'm not saying it's right or wrong but when you're eating an animal you're eating an animal sure no of course and it has to be killed yeah it's a very emotional topic. It's a very complex topic. There's a lot of different facets. And, and yeah. I, I think, you know, like, if your heart's in the right place, hopefully. I think that, you know, because, because I, I am half-half, quite literally, in both fact and, and my education, um, you know, physically, everything. I, I am half-American, half-Chinese. 
So on my Facebook, I have quite a mixture of both as Facebook friends and so on. And I'm just listing Facebook as an example. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I hear there are Chinese people saying bad things about Americans or Americans saying bad things about Chinese there. And I'm always caught in the middle trying to pacify things because it doesn't do any good for us to be at each each other's throats. Sure. We should work together to create the kind of world that we want together because we need to. (laughs) I agree 100%. Um, what, what, What have you been working on or thinking about or talking about Uh, say, in the past couple of months. Now, the biggest silver lining from COVID, of course, is nature is recovering. (laughs) Right. Of course. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All over the planet, nature is recovering. But during this time, you're also seeing that a lot of people have more time on their hands. In Hong Kong, I'm seeing that there are some people that um, there are more people that they may not be the ones making positive changes, but they're very keen on making negative comments and nitpicking on other people's work when other people are trying very hard to just make positive changes. Right. So um, I guess what I'd like to say, try to be happy. <laughs> mm-hmm. try, to, try to bring a positive message to the people around you and, and get everyone to work together towards what's really important. Yeah, contribute to the greater good, for sure. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Ran. I'll see you around. Great photos. See you around. And uh, listen, you know, if you want to show up in a in a beautiful, like, blue evening dress and everything, I just like, <laughs> you, rock it. Rock it. Doesn't matter what the occasion is. Just show up, uh, man. Oh, it's so perfect. I hope to see you around Halloween. That'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Have a great evening. Right. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Yeah.